Hello and welcome to episode 3 of uh, Modern Media Review. I'm Robin Gibson. And I'm Sean Golligley. And it's a bit of an impromptu number 3 post-Christmas because we thought we'd had enough of Christmas telly, what with all the we Christmas did... telly well, yeah, well, I mean, it was... we've had enough of. <laughs> it was ubiquitous. Over Christmas. However, New Year. we found a little gem, a sleeper. Well, that's what they used to call them. Although it didn't sleep for that long, it's the Bross documentary and uh, it had a bit of a massive reception on social media and and in the mainstream media as well. When I started reading about it, I thought I'd completely forgotten Bross even existed. Yeah, well, as you're sitting here in your ripped jeans, Doc Martens with your Grolsch bottle tops on the top. I don't remember. Is that what they wore? Uh, The Brossettes. Grolsch. Oh, did they? Yeah. I thought I'd done some research on this, but I didn't know about the Grolsch bottle top. You know, the little ceramic ones. Yeah, the bottle toppers, yeah. I thought I'd done some research on this, but I didn't know they wore bottle tops in their shoes. Absolutely. I'd completely forgotten about the band. Then I remembered them. And their somewhat, you know, kind of minuscule career at the top. Couple of hits, couple of big hits, couple of small hits. You know, what was your favourite Bross song? There only are two, aren't they? I Owe You Nothing. My favourite. As Terry Wogan introduced it when he was talking to them in this documentary, I Owe Nothing. <laughs> Maybe something going on there in the back of his mind about well, money resting in an account or something. Well, then, during the research, though, I, I always had them down as a pretty ephemeral group, but I found out that um, the thing that impressed me most about their oeuvre, or their canon, <laughs> is that um, someone from Shortlist, a magazine, awarded When Will I Be Famous the accolade of best key change in pop music ever Which... and at 3 minutes 34 apparently he says a musical moment that blew my tiny little mind quite simply one of the greatest key changes of all time kind of diluting it there because he's put it at number one now he's just saying it's one of the greatest of all time and I've so got... obviously there was more to them than met the eye their discography is um is slim that may be true but what I didn't realise and what the documentary showed was that they were actually a band they weren't a manufactured band. Well, they think of themselves as a proper band. And before we leap ahead of ourselves, exactly. I mean, that may sound silly to some people, like uh, Bross thinking of themselves as a proper band is a bit like uh, the Liberal Democrats thinking of themselves as a proper political party, which is just a couple of people standing on the stage waffling on with not much substance behind them. But the whole way this came across on social media and in the in the press when it was reviewed was a really snide thing. It was like... Everyone was saying it's like Spinal Tap Cross with David Brent because of the ludicrous things that Matt and Luke Goss have said. Now, they did say some daft things, but they just sounded like they were a bit lacking in self-awareness. I mean, as I'm saying, right, you've got Luke Goss here with his, he's wearing his rock and roll t-shirts. He's got Soundgarden and Kurt Cobain and CBGBs, which was a famous rock club, you know. And I was impressed by that. Yeah, and then when he was actually talking to some musicians about the ultimate commitment from a mus- musician, he he cited Flea from, from the, the chilies. chilies. Not the Chili Peppers, the, the chilies. chilies. Yeah, probably mates, because both of them, ironically, seeing as it seems that they don't really seem... Well, because they're identical twins, um, you'd imagine they'd be chatting to each other every day. But, oh, you would, yeah. Well, Luke obviously um, left the band, leaving Matt, the singer, saying he was unemployed, out well, of a job. Yeah, but this is we're jumping ahead a bit here. My point here was that we, we were talking about them thinking of themselves as a proper band. I mean, at one point they actually say they were discovered. I mean, there were great pains to say they were discovered, not put together like Take That or something. I mean, you think about it, they're one of the last bands of that flimsy, poppy type not to be put together. Well, you'd imagine we were just on the cusp of Take That and, you know, then the plethora of um, boy bands and all the rest of it. The, the thing is, but this being discovered is that, you know, they showed some footage of them in some grimy club. I mean, it wasn't quite the bar fly, but it was a, <laughs> it was a club, a real club with a roof and a lot of people in it and, well, a, and, a, and not much of a stage set. Put it this way, Robin, it wasn't CBGBs. But neither was it Wembley Arena or, you know, Britain's Got Talent or some Absolutely. kind of uh, Spring Galleys. So I think... Just getting back to the point you were making about people saying it was like Life on the Road, David Brent and Spinal Tap. If you take any of those rockumentaries, they all come across as tools at one stage or another. That's what I mean. That's why I thought it was so unfair to just brand this show as as a kind of the ultimate in Spinal spinal (laughs) Tapism. Because really, they said a few dumb things, but who doesn't? And also, I guess you've got to say for these lads, I think they were, what, 19 when they were launched into the stratosphere of um, pop stardom. So it's a bit Jackson-y, isn't it? They've, uh, they've led a, you could say they might have led a sheltered life. Which was interesting because 
over the last couple of days, there was also um, a repeat of the Oasis documentary, Supersonic. And just for a slight cha- key change, if you like... Um, <laughs> one of the greatest ever. One no, of the I greatest ever. So. Was, um, same thing, you, sibling rivalry in Oasis with Noel and Liam, but slightly different from Luke and Matt, who I don't think, prior to a gig at Whiskey A Go Go in LA, um, discovered crystal meth as the whole road crew did. <laughs> we don't know they didn't. Well, we don't Maybe know. Maybe they just weren't saying about the crystal meth years uh, or weeks. Absolutely. Days. Yeah, that, 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 that may be true. But a totally different a totally different outlook because those lads are pretty self-aware. Um, but can also be British tools. Lads. Oasis lads. Yeah. Mm. I mean, they are more self-aware, but can also come across as tools. The lyrics are equally as cliche-ridden as Brosses, really, aren't they? It's not like they're any better at doing music. But the only thing was, I think, the big hits, of which we know I owe you nothing and um, When Will I Be Famous, and obviously not forgetting Chocolate Box. Well, we only find out about that during the film. But the, Yeah, um, but the weirdest thing is that, you know, you get all these emails about um, gigs to go to and all the rest of it if you've bought tickets online. I didn't even realise they were having a reunion. So this was a total shock to me, to see that not only has there been a reunion... Why would anyone send you emails about Bross having a reunion? What sort of emails do you normally get? Well, I'd get, like, maybe Paul Heaton and Jackie Abbott. That's pretty narrow genre there. You've got (laughs) ex-members of one band. Well, well, two. They seem to be a bit sheltered. The whole film has got a tone of a lack of self-awareness. All these quotes and stuff where they're saying things like "We only had one, we only had a dart to play with as kids, and not not a dart, not even a dartboard to go with it." Are they really that unself-aware? Do they not realise that's funny? I think maybe they do. Maybe they're taking well, odds it, for a raise. It could be know? interesting. I mean, it would be the greatest sort of like joke if um, Matt, in particular, who seemed to come up with some. I don't know whether it's psychobabble or just LA, as you were saying. Well, they both sort of live, one's LA and one's Las Vegas. And people in those places just talk a lot of bollocks anyway. They don't have to be coached into it, you know. I mean, there was one metaphor. I can't remember who was going to, who was going up at the butter knife. Was that Luke? Yeah. No, Chip, Matt. It was Matt. Chipping away. He's been chipping away with a butter knife at a very big tree. That's his career. Timber. Yeah. And then he kind of, he kind of, he kept the butter knife going for a while when he said that he'd said timber. He'd said timber and quite a few trees with that butter knife. And then he could run out of steam and said it's quickly turning into a very effective tool or something. <laughs> and he didn't even think of axe or chainsaw or anything, did he? That's not He's not been coached into saying this. He just run out of steam with his metaphor. Yeah, well, I mean, he did it on several. I mean, when they were in band rehearsals, and um, this is where you first saw the sibling rivalry start to sort of like manifest itself because Matt, as he said, and this was Brent-esque, uh, I am the front man. Sue me. He said it was a lifelong apology for being the front man because of this problem with Luke feeling... Left out, no, basically. Even, he did use the word jealous at one point. Yeah. Which you would be if you're sitting behind a drum kit bashing away. And in fact, probably hardly anyone hears what you're doing and your brother's up front. You're the block in the shadows. And let's be frank, who really, unless you're into sort of 70s sort of like prog rock or something like that, who gives a monkeys about a drummer? But they can't exist without the drummer. Without the drummer, it's Matt Goss solo, and that was a flop. And that was a flop. So he needs Luke. He does. Does Luke need him? Well... Not it... really. Luke's a successful actor now, isn't he? He in is. In B-movie sort of... Well, hang on, he's been in Hellboy 2 and Blade 2. Yeah, good movies, <laughs> <laughs> A lot of his filmography is straight to DVD. As they do they still do it. that? Apparently so for him, yeah. <laughs> When was the last time you bought a DVD? Uh, many years ago. We've got off the point here about their unself-awareness, because I'm saying they can't be that unself-aware because they couldn't say all these things that have been widely quoted in the media without knowing how ludicrous some of them sound. On the other hand, there was a segment where they returned by plane to Britain and got off at the airport with a load of <laughs> mature brossettes. Now, to me, the mature brossettes who were gathering round and giving them hugs and kisses, they they were to- they knew it was a bit of a laugh. You know, they were having a laugh with their I, I Heart Matt posters. Whereas to Matt and Luke, arriving separately... It was a glorious homecoming. It was back to the old days. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, it's a toss-up here whether they are self-aware or not self-aware. And the other thing, Robin, is that... I find it difficult, even if somebody texts me and say, I'm coming in on BA452 
from Los Angeles to Heathrow. I struggle to see, find where that is, even what terminal it is. And how do they find out what planes these guys are on? Super fans have got a, mis- a kind of mystical understanding of where their idols are going to be. Either that or they just go where they think they're going to be and wait, as the bloke said in the documentary, in, in the heyday when all the fans were waiting outside the house. Well, this They'd was just been sitting there. I mean, this was the thing. What else are they going to do? Well, this was before, obviously, before you had anything else to do. Um, and there was no social media, no mobile phones. And yet they were all 400 people outside the house. It must be terrible being a super fan from the era of anything from the Beatles up to Bros. Because after that, you could take a selfie with your idols. All they've <laughs> yeah. got are. are Kind of limp memories, really. Well, it, maybe the odd autograph. Well, it was funny because a lot of the um, mature brossettes had scrapbooks. They brought their old scrapbooks oh, to, to Heathrow or Gatwick. That was lovely. But it, it was, in yeah. the end, you know, that's what I felt about the film. I mean, I said the social media and the media reviews were a bit snide and snippy and backhanded because well, the film, the film's quite moving. As is Brossy's quest <laughs> to get back and play this comeback gig. These guys, I mean, they're hardly the people we'd say it, but they've given... It's like that line, rock and roll, I gave you the best years of my life. Okay, they've had a bit in the middle where they ain't been doing their band, as they call it, but the fact is, they are passionately committed to this, and they tried so hard to get it back together. Well, the second half of the film's been sort of ignored. Well, I was just going to say that. The second half of the film is it is quite... Well, it's moving and tragic, and also it's... the well, interesting. There's three, there's three bits of tragedy. Number one, Luke felt he was ugly... Yep. And had to have his ears pinned back. Yeah. That was superseded and probably pushed aside by the dual tragedy, firstly, of their sister being killed in a car crash and their mum dying relatively young. Absolutely. All of this was uh, kind of covered, and, and very touchingly covered, I thought. There was a bit where they were talking about the picture of their mother watching them at Wembley. Oh, yeah. And yeah. she was full of light, which sounds a bit pseudo-religious, like that painter, you know. But... It was a good photograph, and it reminded me of that film Billy Elliot, where oh, the f- a, a crap film, admittedly, but the ending very powerful, where the the cynical father who sees Billy his dancing son and went yeah. down the mine exactly sees Billy dancing and is overwhelmed by emotion. That picture of their mum looked just like that. So, Robin, what you're saying to me is you like Bros, Billy Elliot. What's next, Mamma Mia? I didn't start Mamma Mia. I didn't like a show. I didn't start Cats. doing this. I didn't start doing this podcast tonight, or indeed at any time, to be nice. <laughs> but as the film went on, I felt myself being drawn towards Matt and Luke and their problems, and the fact that they really wanted to bang out a fantastic show. And critical of the people who were criticising it. Well, I mean, it, it, the program is littered with classic quotes, so it is very easy if you're reviewing something to lift out these things individually. But there was, and I hate to say the word journey, but there was, there was a very, mo- <laughs> yeah, there was a very moving journey, which was the um, the re the, the refinding of the brothers' sort of love. You mean when they went back home? Oh, to where they grew up, which was a little bit unaware, wasn't it? Again, I think this was interesting because. Not like they came from the gutter or the 14th story of the tower block, but they didn't come from Richie's like Mumford and Son or some of these future Tory cabinet bands. Yeah. But, and also, who wants to listen to Mumford and Sons? Nobody. Going back home was one of the other strange things. So various houses that they'd lived in and all the rest of it. and oh, too. They were staring wistfully into the distance. Um and I think it was Matt said to Luke, he said... Um, well, they were standing in the corner of the road. They weren't staring wistfully into the dust. <laughs> Saying, do you think Kevin still lives over there? And he goes, no, I don't think Kevin's Kevin there anymore. Know, I think Kevin. Is he not? Kevin's no, moved I don't on. think so. How are they going to know where Kev is? <laughs> they haven't been back for 25 years. <laughs> so there were all these ludicrous things. But then, you know, we got on to all that stuff about planning the set for the gig and the rehearsals, excruciating stuff with these old session musicians, totally bamboozled by this sibling psychosis going on. Absolutely. And he kept falling out, didn't he? And it, it, was, it, it didn't come to blows because they're not those kind of guys. No. You can't imagine them thumping each other. Although there was a moment when they went to do an interview on this morning where um, they were in the sort of like dressing room waiting to go on, um, where they had a very flouncy argument, but... Um, Matt actually got up and stood over Luke. But he only got up and stood over him because he was crying. <laughs> or he was about to cry. No, no, no. I can't have that. He, Mind he you, wasn't going to hit him, you know. If you, if you dropped them into a pit, who would come out? 
Luke would come out without a doubt. <laughs> well, he has well, the got... thing is, this is a question, just because he's bald and he acts in these films, they both look pretty fit for blokes who are 50. And he's also, Luke's got that thousand-yard stare. You that know. comes from sitting on rocks in the desert near LA and sort of trying to refine, what was it he said? Some real estate that's not contaminated. I like that. I don't think he was talking about sewage problems <laughs> in his flat. I don't think he was, no. Anyway, I mean, look, they've got their rehearsals going on, they've, they've gone back home, and they've basically kind of convinced me, they, they're deserving of just as much sort of um, kudos as any band who, who are trying their best to come back to their fans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, mind you, there was one classic sort of spinal tap moment. Where... Well, no, you can't keep going through this going, mind you, and bringing it back to a classic <laughs> spinal tap moment, because... I think we've decided that it's more than that. Towards the end of the film, it became absolutely fascinating because when they got back towards the O2, they were really in awe of coming back to play this big gig. At the end of the film, it it became fascinating kind of evocation of what it's like to come back after all this time and do a massive gig at the O2. And well, it was brilliant when they walked into the O2 and and um, you can just see that they're sort of like filled with an awe of what's going to happen. Yeah, nerves, I'd say. And, and I, I, again, I found that quite touching. I mean, the other thing about that whole build-up is they gave you 10 days to the gig, four days to the gig. It basically showed you Luke Goss bashing around in the drum kit. Matt not even getting a chance to hardly sing, sing at all. Because at all, yeah. Luke was trying to alpha male him about organising the rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, there's no way... This is going to get Matt- off the ground. No, I didn't think that. I thought, there's no way they're going to put on a broth-style mega show with this kind of rehearsal of a few blokes in a room. You're not even playing. And uh, halfway through, actually, one of the quotes that hasn't been said much is... Luke went, um, well, Rome wasn't built built in a day, and that's true. But we haven't got the time that Rome had. And they didn't. But somehow they put all this together into a big gig that was remarkably... And there was one bit near the end of it where... Um, They're getting ready to go on. Getting ready to go on yeah. stage. And I've seen loads of footage of people, you know, under the stage and tramping through the back of the hall and all that stuff which has become a bit of a cliche this was one of the best ever footage of that sort of thing where as they're waiting to go up in the rise or thing there's a sort of mixture of fear and awe and excitement on their faces and you think good god these guys really are excited about this it's fantastic and they put on a big show although again self-awareness is an issue I mean Billy Idol for example actually not for example Billy Idol is (laughs) the epitome of this sort of thing he is self-aware, and he knows how ludicrous it is, and it makes him more entertaining for it. Yeah, well, you, whereas you always thought that Matt um, was living living it again, and he, there was one stage where he said that, and we will have more hits. Yeah, <laughs> which they won't. Which they won't, no. I mean, they struggled to have more hits when they had some hits, didn't <laughs> they? did, they? yeah. Especially Chocolate Box, which... <laughs> Got dropped from the set. Well, apparently that led to... I don't know if it's as simple as this, but the impression the film gave was that when the devastating news came in that Chocolate Box had only reached number nine in the chart. Oh, Luke. Left the band. He did, yeah. And then some, the next day someone came and took all his motors away. <laughs> yeah. But he suggested where... he didn't have a lot of money at the time. And, and where did the money go? Well, I don't know. Well, well, let's get on to that in a minute. Everyone absolutely loved it. So I'd say good luck to them, even though after all that, you know, the music's rubbish. What? It's rubbish, you know. What are you talking about? Well, brass music is rubbish. It's not even good I pop owe... music of its genre. I owe you nothing, mate. Number one. You, loads of people have been number one. Joe Dolce, Mr Blobby. <laughs> Mr Blobby, you'd have been a big betting queue in Mr Blobby. You know? <laughs> no way. Yeah, he was eight to one. <laughs> Christmas number one. His only hit. He had less hits than Bross, you know, just the one. No, because I worked for a company whose distributor was the same as Mr Blobby's. And okay. we found out that he was going to go back up, having been number one, going down to number two. But surely no one goes back to number one. It had never been done before, but he'd got a new edition of his record with a free badge. And it had <laughs> propelled him past, take that, I think it was, to go back to number one. And he was eight to one. So we went round to betting shops with 20, 30 pounds. You can't put more than that on a Christmas number one. Well, so otherwise, otherwise some, someone will realise something's going on. I know, so we'd about 20 or 30 bets on round, but we got quite a few hundred quid on at 8 to 1. And then, it <sighs> shames me to say it, but the guy who ruined it for everyone was halfway through the week. 
a guy from my hometown of Paisley from a record shop there walked into Ladbrokes in Glasgow <laughs> with a grand, <laughs> slapped it down and said, Mr. Bobby, <laughs> Christmas number one. Shut us down. Shut us down, <laughs> betting closed. The next day I went in to try and get another 20 quid. Oh, I'm sorry, son, it's all finished, that, Mr. Blobby. And when we picked the money up, there was a lot of stewards' inquiries, <laughs> remarks. Yeah. There was another documentary a bit like this recently about UB40. Which, more sibling yeah. nonsense. Which was a fantastic documentary. It was, like this. Yeah. Not quite as good as this. It's still good. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think UB Forty's music is worse than Bros. <laughs> so that's partly why this one's better. It's the most dull stuff ever. What? At least Bros has got a bit of sparkle about it. What are you talking about? Brought reggae to Britain, mate. <laughs> oh, yeah, them and the police, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. If it hadn't been for them, reggae would be dead. I always wonder in these things. It happened in the UB40 as well. Where, where did the money where go? Where did all this where money, did the money go? go? Yeah. I mean, they must have had quite a lot of money. Well, someone had quite a lot of money. Someone had quite a lot of money. And yet, one minute in these stories, it's there. And then the next is this kind of hole. And then after the hole, they're going, oh, we never had any money. And then you never find out who took it, whether well, they did something bad with it, well, it's wasted almo- it. It's almost like they went down to the market and saw somebody doing the three-card trick. Well, a four-card trick, I reckon, in this case, you know. Find the lady. I'll have 10 million quid on that, please. This is my point, because Luke says in the documentary, because people said we spunked our money away and we didn't, but if they didn't... Someone did. There was a an implication in the UB41 that someone else had their money away. There was also an implication that some of it went up their noses. <laughs> but in this, there was no implication. The money just disappeared. I really, I really find that difficult to understand and also you've got to remember that these were sort of like 19 to 21 i guess they were 19 to 21 i mean he was saying when matt was saying they played um, madison square garden when at 21 mean, yeah, tw- like that, yeah yeah and yeah. wembley stadium you know yeah, yeah. so these are big grossing yeah. that was again another touching bit because at the end they looked just as excited as they must have been then couldn't believe it well, I think Matt probably thought he was back at Wembley Stadium. I think he did, yeah. You know? I mean, it's dark, you can't really see the audience, you don't realise that they're all about 60 years old. <laughs> you know? And there's nothing wrong with that, Robin. No, no, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying you don't realise you're not getting a new crowd. <laughs> no one knew he was going to like Bros, are they? Anyway, we liked the Bros film, we, I liked it. We did. I think, I think, I think we was... liked it for different reasons. Well, you obviously like it for the reasons that the snide people on social media it's liked it. Because, because it looked silly. No, no, that's... I liked it because it was a, a, it was a rock and roll story. Hang on, I'm not going to allow you to come people, across as the good guy all the people time. People genuinely... <laughs> it's outrageous. Passionate. They were passionate about what they did, mate. Yeah, I'm not saying they weren't. I said I loved it for both reasons. If you, if you want to go down the... The easy route is to listen to... And I'm sure if you've been closeted, closeted for... Um, 25 years in this sort of like bubble that you're going to come out with some load of dross. I mean, I know I would. I'd be, you know, I'd be unbearable, to be honest. I'm bad enough as I am now. We obviously just went from, you know, secondary school athletic team to <laughs> yeah. being, having 500 people outside their house every night. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be able to deal with that. But yeah, I mean, but the money went. And what they really should have done... They should, well, they were never going to have good business heads on them at that age. Oh, I guess, no. We haven't got good bids and heads on us either. No, we haven't. And, we, and, and really, we've got no excuse. No, I know, because we've been studying um, <laughs> one of my favourite websites, entrepreneur.com. Which Unmiss- unmissable. Unmissable. going to be the subject of our next podcast, which is coming very, very, very soon. Which should um, mean by, what, within a week we'd be within, millionaires? Well, hopefully, yeah, if yeah. you follow the advice. I think it's pretty straightforward. So we'll have more about that next time. Only remains to say, have a look at the website because we've got a website, modernmediareview.com. We're on Twitter. We're um, you can hear our podcasts YouTube. all over the place YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify. Spotify. I think that's all the plugging we've got to do so we can say, fairly well, and good night. Cheers. See you soon. <laughs>